for everything you do throughout the week to improve the lives of others, both near and far. Joel Swanson, thank you for your service. And would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, Joel? to the flag Oh, he's got a baby. A baby either. <laughs> Hi, folks. Welcome to Rotary again today. <clears throat> Our guest speaker is going to talk a little bit about lightning. And where there's lightning, there's often rain. So this Cretan's Clearwater song, Who'll Stop the Rain? Florida. <laughs> oh, yeah. One, two, three, four. Long as I remember, the rain can come and down. Clouds of misery pour in, confusion on the ground. So, Past President Carolyn, would you please join us for your thought for the day? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I have two stories that I'm going to share with you today. So the first one, there were five men in an airplane, the pilot, a lawyer, Elon Musk, and the president of the Rotary Club of Livermore, and a Boy Scout. They were flying along when the plane started to go down. Noticing that there were only four parachutes, the pilot grabbed a parachute and jumped out. Now with only three left, the lawyer said, without me, the world would be dull. So he grabs a parachute and jumps out. Then Elon stood up and said, I can't imagine what the world would be like without me. So he grabbed a parachute and jumped out. President Mark turns to the Boy Scout and says, young man, I've lived my life and I know where I'm going. So you go ahead and take the last parachute. The Boy Scout replied, no, we can both go. Elon Musk took my backpack. <laughs> so one more story. A young couple moves into a new neighborhood. The next morning, while they are eating breakfast, the young man sees his neighbor hanging the wash outside. That laundry is not very clean, he said. She doesn't know how to wash correctly. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. His wife looked on, but remained silent. Every time his neighbor would hang her wash to dry, the young man would make the same comment. About a month later, the man was surprised to see nice clean wash on the line and said to his wife, 
Look, she's learned to wash correctly. I wonder who taught her this. The wife said, I got up early this morning and washed our windows. <laughs> and so it is with life. What we see when watching others depends on the window through which we look. So meeting front line, we have Will Bateson, Spur reporter. By the way, Kathy Coyle won't be here, but she'll be uh, publishing the Spur this week. But, I think, yeah, right. More later. Publisher, thank you, Don, for all you've done this week. Don Wentz, Spur publisher. Our outstanding photographer, Irv Stowers. Audiovisual, Don was here, I think, at uh, about 9 a.m. this morning and got things all set up. Uh, greeter, our wonderful greeter, immediate past president, Sheila, and Jeff Youngsma, our Zoom videographer. Uh, Trex Donovan, Bob Bishop, our sergeants at arms, webmaster Kathy Coyle, public outreach Kelly Bowers, and Niall Rungi, videographer. So do we have any, I know we have some, uh, visiting Rotarians today. So Martin is, Martin is looking forward to uh, joining our club. Would you like to stand up, Martin? Okay, great. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, standing in President to introduce Sandel, my son-in-law, Tim Best, who was a past member of our club. And uh, good to see him. Welcome, Tim. Welcome, Tim. And Sonia Sheffield, birthdays and anniversaries? Yes. Well, oh, visiting yes. guests, I'm sorry. Okay. A little rusty here. I'd like to introduce a gentleman who is uh, supporting the program today, longtime friend, Dr. Jaganakela, whom I've tried to talk into joining our Rotary many times. Many years ago, his third daughter, Mamata, was one of our exchange students, and we sent her to Spain because she spoke Spanish, and we spent, sent her to a Catalan part of Spain. So it wasn't exactly Spanish. Anyway, she is one of the country's uh, finest cartographers now and sought after by many. So let's welcome Jagan. Okay, uh, I'll introduce the speaker further, but right now, Dr. Giri is our guest, visiting guest. Welcome, Dr. Giri. Ladies and gentlemen, he's uh, stopped by to join uh, our meeting today and is interested in the club. This is um, Merlin Martin. Did we get all Okay. Are you ready for Sonia? Thank you. All right, everybody. October birthdays, it's a very small select group. Um, October 2nd, moi. <laughs> okay. October 9th is Trex Donovan. Today's his birthday. October 10th is Alan Burnham. And Alan's online. 
Um, October 16th is Patrick McMenamin. And October 29th is Paul McCandless. All right. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rotary. Happy birthday to you. Okay. Anniversaries. Keith Beck, October 11th, nine years. Over there. Okay. Ted Michaels, October 28th, 17 years. Loretta Kasky, October 9th, 20 years. And Jim Schmidt, 30 years on October 22nd. Not here. Mike Morgan, uh, Mike and Nancy, October 28th, 41 years. Okay. Chris Ising, Chris and Patty, October 16th, 42 years. Dennis O'Brien, I think he's out with his bride today, October 3rd, 54, where? Oh, oh, sorry, Dennis, 54 years, congratulations. And then TJ holds the record, 57 years, congratulations. Did they call you a sweetheart? Yeah, you know that works? Yeah, but I'm not saying that. They call you a sweetheart. What's the next word? <laughs> Okay, we have a number of announcements that I'd like to roll through quickly. Uh, Glenn Kubiak, do you have something to say about the READY program? Thank you. So the READY program, as you know, is um, a tutoring and mentoring program for students at Junction Avenue Middle School. They're sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And um, we have exceeded sort of all expectations with the size of the group of students we have this year because of the immense and crucial needs that um, that they have in education in large part due to the pandemic um, restrictions of their attendance and so on. So we have over 20 students and yet our cohort of mentors is uh, is reduced. We've got several people that are on medical leave and travel and so on. So for those of you who have been in the program in the past, I'd really like to shame you. I mean, uh, uh, encourage you to come back into the program. There will be shaming too. Uh, and for those of you, especially newer members, uh, would very strongly encourage you to get involved because it's a, it's a wonderfully fulfilling. Um, these kids, uh, just a little bit of effort and you can see them blossom. Their educational world just opens up with very little effort. It's, you know, one, one afternoon on, a week. So, um, and in addition, we go on field trips and uh, we are in bad need of drivers and chaperones. We're going to the Exploratorium on the 19th. So all those things taken together. And you might wonder, gee, how can I get develop a relationship as a mentor if there are 20 students and only, let's just say, a half a dozen or so Rotary mentors? And there are many, many ways that it happens. I'll just give you some examples when Linda Tinney and Debbie Peck and, um, and Carol Lintz come. She's got several students, despite the size, they come and they hug her, okay? All three of them. So these relationships develop when you're chaperoning, you've got some time with one or two or three kids and you really can make an influence both in the tactical part of their tutoring and helping them make sense of math and English language arts and so on, but also in the more strategic relationship as a tutor, as a mentor, where you can help guide them through some of the waypoints of their lives. So strongly encourage you to get involved. It's going very, very well this year, and we're, I think, making a really big impact. Thank you, Glenn. 
And Khaled, uh, do you have uh, two minutes for uh, TRF? Great. And Kathy Coyle wanted me to remind you to consider attending the District 5170 Avenues of Service event on Saturday, October 19th. So we've had other uh, uh, flyers going out for that. And uh, I think immediate past President Sheila was, uh, had just, a- yeah. Just a quick follow up. Sure. Um, what we're going to do this year is show series of two minute videos like that to educate, make people understand the big picture, what Rotary, Rotary International is. And we're going to be starting a campaign kickoff in two weeks uh, to show more details on an individual basis. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. Uh, thank you. Um, oh, you did. <laughs> um, one real quick. Um, tonight is our Rotary Wine Social, unlike our month-end Rotary meeting. Uh, tonight is our Wine Social. It will be held from 5 to 7, Wood Family Vineyards on Research. Sonia has so graciously reserved the barrel room there for us. I'll be providing little snacks and you buy your wine. And we had a wonderful turnout last time. If you'd like to bring a guest, your wife, um, whomever, uh, husband, um, please do. We have a great time and it's just for a couple hours. Um, love to see as many as possible of you all. Thank you, President Jill. And Michael Ferrucci has a flyer on the table and we'll give you a brief uh Brief. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody that brought flyers for, for me today. Um, take one home with you. If you have a neighbor you would like to give it to someone, um, I just want to say uh, that we're having this. This is like a, a flash concert, basically, because it's only in a couple of weeks. It's like less than 20 days, I think, um, coming up here. It's at the Vineyard, or I should say uh, AMC Cellars and uh, JMC Cellars. So I don't know why I keep saying AMC. It's reservations only. I can only fit about 50 people there. That's if weather cooperates. If weather doesn't cooperate, we could go outside. But I don't, I can't tell how many people we're going to, it's going to be 50. Um, I have to pay the artist. I have to pay the, the sellers at JMC. And um, I will do as best I can on my own to pull that off. Tickets are $35. If I sell 50 tickets at $35, that's $1,700, $1,750. Um, paying for the artists, paying for uh, the venue, we'll end up with about $1,000. Um, we could use $1,000 in the Rotary Music Scholarship uh, and 
please, if you can, if you can't make it, thirty-five dollars, you could donate to the foundation, and that would be a tremendous help. All right, I just want to say thank you again. Uh, it's a really small venue. It's intimate. If you were at the last concert we had with Richard Smith, you know the kind of talent that you're going to see, and this will be a very intimate event uh, at that vineyard or cellars. She keeps correcting me. It's cellars, JMC cellars. Okay, thank you. Does Does everybody know where that is? At down on Greenville. Big, yeah, the old big White House. Yeah. There you go. Did you have something, Mike? No. I think Joel Swanson. I tried it. I heard a few words about um, Joel Swanson. Gosh, was what was he doing? Was he? As as some of you may know, I was uh, out of town the past three weeks. It was a terrible uh, ordeal. I had to eat and drink wine for 20 days in northern Italy. So um, and drink wonderful coffee in the morning and have pastries. It, it was it was really bad. Uh, by the way, traveling along with me were Philomena Rambo, who was a he is a past president of the Morning Club, and Tom Vargas, who was formerly of our club. So a um, lot of familiar faces along with us, including some Rotarians. The uh, poem up there says, From your goodness we have received this wine, fruit of the vine, and the work of our hands. So anyway, cool poem, cool place. Um, and as a... Uh, how cool was it? There we go. Okay. President's Club. There's no mark here. And I'm going to put $100 towards the uh, John Shirley uh, Scholarship Fund. That sounds great, Jill. Thank you. So, uh, so next week, President Mark will be back at the podium, and uh, he'll uh, be looking a lot better than I am uh, speaking from the podium. So... Um, President Mark hasn't given us a lot of details on uh, what he's received so far for uh, folks who are doing uh, remembrances of uh, John Shirley. So please send your, your ideas for those remembrances to either President Mark or me so we can get those squared into the slide deck next week. Thank you. And Don? Oh, Christian's in the... Uh... Christian, you're muted. Ah, uh, yes. We can hear you now. Yeah, he's a president. Um, yeah, I have a lot of good things happening. You know, yeah, so, and um, on like the vacation in Italy, I'm going to be flying into what could be a danger zone in Orlando for a conference uh, like on the 26th morning, you know, when Michael is doing this stuff on the 25th. So in anticipation of that, hopefully it's going to be a good flight, you know, before before then I hope that all the craziness will subside. I would love to donate to the music scholarship concert and I would like to give $150 towards that. I'm sure Michael appreciates that. Thank you, Christian. My pleasure. So, Gaud, I think uh, you can come up and present today's wonderful presenter. President-elect Pat and fellow Rotarians and guests, I am very pleased uh, and a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today and a good friend of mine, Dr. Dave Giri. I have known him for over 40 years in association with Livermore Hindu Temple. Since 1984, he's a self-employed consultant doing business as Protec, performing R&D work for a US government and industry. He is a world-renowned researcher and published several technical books. Some of them are put on the 
a table in the back. You can look at it. And uh, his experience is in the field of nuclear electromagnetic pulse, high power microwaves, and uh, ultra wide band system of which I know very little. And uh, he has more diplomas than I can count on fingers of my one hand. He earned three diplomas from top schools in India and three from Harvard. He even has a single author book published by Harvard University Press. He is a life fellow of Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and was inducted into their Hall of Fame. A distinguished lecturer of IEEE and has received many national and international awards, notably in New Delhi and in British Parliament. He has lectured in our road, uh, in various Rotary clubs in the Bay Area, including El Cerrito, San Ramon. Uh, he has also worked with our club in the past on a project uh, where the Hindu temple donated smoke detectors and us, the Rotarians, went and installed in uh, seniors. Anybody remember that? Okay, so so that's a uh, direct involvement with the Rotary. All right, I call him a gentleman scholar. Welcome, Bivi Giri. Thank you, Gaurd, for those uh, nice words of introduction. And ladies and gentlemen in the room, and also some online here. Um, I saw this flyer about the Music Scholarship upcoming concert by Michael Ferrucci. Did I say your name right? Um, <clears throat> I am a wannabe musician. <laughs> I have been learning music, uh, a style of Indian music for the last three years online from a teacher in Mumbai. So I'd like to announce a donation to you, a scholarship uh, program of $1,000. Today I'm going to talk, uh, by the way, somebody said, uh, Gaud uh, did not use all his time and he had 30 seconds left. <laughs> uh, with uh, Gaud's permission, I'll use up those 30 seconds. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, lightning. Uh, both, there are two kinds. One is natural, that's sort of God made, you can say, and trigger, which we can send something up into the sky to attract the lightning to where you want it to land and make measurements. Uh, that's how we make a, an effort to understand lightning. So there are two types of lightning. I worked for NASA for seven years uh, in their storms hazard program in the 80s. I'll talk about that and also talk about why NASA was interested in lightning. Uh, okay. Um, this is my outline. Um, I won't go into this, but the most important thing is, I guess this does not have a pointer. Am I right? Okay. Um, the most important thing is that statistical data of um, lightning, uh, lightning related activities, uh, lightning related accidents actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and how it affects people and animals and the 80s study of NASA Langley that uh, I referred to. And there are also many, many facilities around the world uh, to study lightning, understand lightning. Once we understand what lightning is all about, then we can uh, do something to protect ourselves, our buildings, our flying systems like airplanes, or even uh, space shuttle during the launch phase. Okay, that's why NASA got interested in this. And in the United States, we made a lot of measurements in the Rockies, uh, a mountain called uh, uh, South Baldy Peak in New Mexico, not far from Almogordo, where the first nuclear explosion took place in the 40s. Uh, to study lightning, lightning is coming down from the cloud to the earth. 
So you have to get yourself up off the ground. So you find yourself a mountain, put a tall structure, and that's where lightning wants to land because that's the tallest thing in the surrounding area. So we go to mountains like these, even Italy, Switzerland, uh, other countries have uh, followed suit. Uh, my favorite is the Swiss one, although we started it here in the in, in the United States. I'll talk about some of these uh, facilities as well. Um, what is lightning? Lightning is a transient current. That's a big current that flows for a short time. And the highest ever current that has ever been measured, uh, even theorized from a physics point of view, by the way, I'm not going to show you any equations today. That's my usual style. <laughs> uh, 200,000 amps is the highest ever current uh, measured in lightning. And this current lasts for a very short time, uh, about a millionth of a second. So it's a lot of current for a short time. That means it has a lot of power, but not much energy. Energy is power times how long that power lasts. You know, we all pay electric bills in kilowatt hours. It's power times time. Um, it is an electrical discharge, but the path lengths are very large because we're talking of discharge from cloud to ground. That's a long path length. Uh, difference between electricity and lightning, we pay for electricity, we don't pay for lightning. <laughs> Unfortunately, lightning, <clears throat> since it doesn't have much energy, it is not something we can harvest and use for our own use. It just happens, we don't even know where it's going to hit and it's done with in a microsecond. So we can't really really take that energy, put it all together and use it for our uh, uh, daily life. Uh, how lightning starts in a cloud? Uh, clouds, there are different types of clouds. Uh, there are certain clouds that are especially uh, prone to start lightning. Uh, cloud is nothing but a collection of water, snow, and ice particles. And there is some physics behind this, how some of these particles get charged um, in a storm. And some get positive charge, some get negative charge. These charges separate. That process is not really very well understood. There have been attempts to make clouds in a lab called a cloud chamber. Uh, Wilson, the physicist, got a Nobel Prize for that. Uh, so that's how it starts. And there are if that top line is the cloud and this is the uh, ground, this is how it starts from the ground, uh, so from the cloud. It's called step leader. It sort of branches off finally and gets to the ground. It finds a path to the ground. If I'm, a, uh, if I'm flying an airplane in its path, airplane being a metal object, it tends to attract lightning. The lightning is try to, trying to find a path of least resistance from cloud to ground. So I'm a big body of metal, it'll hit me if I'm flying there. And then what happens in lightning when it hits an airplane is it attaches at some point and it'll detach. So in that process, it charges up the airplane. The airplane gets uh, electrical charges. So when you are flying from, let's say from here to New York, and uh, you fly into some thunder clouds, and the pilot knows that his plane has been charged up. So when he lands, the plane is still charged. It has some amount of columns of charge in it. You can't get off the plane because you're also charged. So what they do when the plane lands is they pull up these uh, grounding rods from the ground and hook it to the airplane and bleed all the charges before anybody gets off. If you have wondered why we have landed but they're not letting me off the plane, this could be one of the reasons, okay? <clears throat> um, uh, this is uh, showing uh, lightning. Uh, it's a lightning flash, and the flash can sway in the wind. That can happen. Um, <clears throat> and it also, because the charges are moving, there's a plasma and a shock wave associated with it, and the shock wave at a distance becomes a sound. That's the thunder that you hear. The clouds are not noisy, it's the shock wave that makes it noisy. Now, here I'm showing two types of uh, lightning. This one is going from one cloud to another cloud. And this one is going from cloud to ground. Here you can see the buildings uh, at the bottom. Um, 
I, I used to keep track of the uh, database of all the accidents of commercial aviation and some military as well. Uh, I am a defense guy. I've spent uh, 45 years of my professional career working for various uh, DOD agencies. I worked for Air Force, uh, Army, uh, <clears throat> Marine Corps, and Navy. I'm currently doing a project for Navy. Um, the, as you can see, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even in the 90s, uh, there were flights that were uh, struck by lightning, and resulting in fatalities. Okay, Planes would actually fall out of the sky during those uh, accidents, and people died. That's when, now, there is one here, Apollo 12, uh, that uh, NASA was launching. Oh, before I get to Apollo, I wanted to mention this accident that happened in 1996. Some of you may know about this. There was an airline called uh, TWA, Transworld Airlines. Uh, this plane took off from uh, JFK. <clears throat> it was going to Charles de Gaulle in Paris. And it exploded <clears throat> 19 minutes after takeoff. <clears throat> and fell to the bottom of the Atlantic. And there was some investigation done. Why do we investigate such crashes? Because we want to know what really happened and we want to avoid it from happening again. And that is the motivation for airplane uh, crash accident uh, investigations. NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, uh, FBI, CIA, everybody was involved. And they studied the, this for four years. They brought all the debris from the bottom of the Atlantic and into a hangar in Long Island and rebuilt about 70, 80% of the aircraft. This is a picture of that airplane debris being put together in a hangar. Only United States would do something like that. <clears throat> I'm really proud of that fact because in many nations they say, oh, it happened, it's their fate or whatever. Who is going to spend millions of dollars going to the bottom of the Atlantic, getting the debris, putting it all together, trying to understand what may have happened? US, okay. <clears throat> now here, this is not a lightning related crash, but there is a connection. What we found out, I, I got involved peripherally for this accident crash investigation. Actually, after four years, NTSB said, oh, we don't know what happened. The cause of the accident was unknown uh, in that investigation. <clears throat> now, somebody got involved after that, and I was contacted. And we, what we found out was in the, an airplane like this, a 747, you have fuel tanks under the wings, both wings. And then you have a fuel tank under the belly, central fuel tank. And the pilot uses the tanks on both sides and keeps the weight in balance. And the central fuel tank is sort of a reserve. And it's rarely full. That means there is fuel in the central tank and there is vapors, fuel vapors, above that. It turns out that the fuel vapors are more flammable than the fuel itself. So if there is a spark in the fuel tank that's not full, it will explode. That's what happened here. That's what we found out. There are a pair of wires that go from the tank to the cockpit and tells the pilot how much fuel is got. And there was a spark between these wires. We established that fact. So that spark is like a little lightning <laughs> that took place between two wires. So in a sense, this is a lightning, a mini lightning, you might say, that, was, that happened inside the fuel tank. So after this study, we recommended, um, uh, our team recommended that airlines should carry uh, cylinders of an inert gas like nitrogen. Why? Because when the fuel level goes down, you replace the fumes with nitrogen. Of course, airlines hate us for that. <laughs> Who wants to carry nitrogen cylinders when they can take another passenger or something, you know, sell a ticket, right? So, that, so many things came out of this study. That's the good thing of uh, such investigation. We also said when you examine the, uh, 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 the health of certain critical wires such as these, you can't just go there and look at it and say, oh, looks good, I check it off and the pilot takes off. That's not a good thing. 
So we recommended active testing of certain very critical wires in airplanes. We put a current here, measure current there, put a voltage here, measure voltage there, make sure nothing is happening. So that was that. Um, thanks. Um, there's a lot of statistics about how often uh, airplanes get hit. You can be sure that you've been on airplanes that was hit by lightning because it happens so often, okay? Uh, the procedure in the United States by the Federal Aviation Administration is that if a pilot suspects that he was hit by lightning, when he comes down, or if he knows he's been hit by lightning, when he comes down and lands that plane, he has to fill a bunch of forms and say that I was uh, hit by lightning, this happened or this happened or nothing happened. Pilots don't want to fill forms when they land. They've flown for eight hours, 10 hours, whatever. So they just want to go home, right? So the lightning strike incidents on airplanes are totally underreported. Even with all that, we have quite a few data. Uh, this is Apollo 12 during its launch. And as it took off, it was stuck by, uh, struck by lightning. Uh, 30 seconds into launch and 52 seconds into launch, they lost the guidance. And they were ready to abort the Saturn V rocket. And there was a young engineer, John Aaron, I think was his name, 24 year old, he was just trainee. And he told the astronauts what to do in that situation. That really saved the day, saved the launch, saved the astronauts, saved everybody. He just asked them to switch the power to aux auxiliary power. That's all they did and they survived. And they were hit by lightning. This is when NASA said, we need to do something about this. We need to understand lightning and protect our launch vehicles uh, from lightning. And they started a program. Um, uh, this I have already mentioned. Uh, I'll come back to the NASA program. Uh, lightning rods are used in protecting buildings. I'm sure even this building will have some kind of protection. More important in tall buildings, uh, by the side of the building or top of the building. If you put a rod on a building, it only protects you from lightning that comes in a certain conical angle, maybe 30, 40 degrees. So you need a sort of a system of rods, not just one rod. And these system of rods about the building are interconnected and there are down conductors that bring the lightning back into the ground uh, and the current will flow into the ground protecting buildings. Not only the building, you know, almost every building has power coming in, commercial power. So lightning can strike that power line you may have experienced or seen these power transformers on a pole getting blown away from lightning. That happens more often than we realize. Okay, PG&E will come and fix it, okay? Uh, now, uh, Benjamin Franklin, you see his picture on a $100 bill. <laughs> he was the first one to measure lightning. And I won't go into his... Uh, his experiment, people who have tried to replicate his building have actually died getting hit by lightning. So you have to be careful when you do lightning measurements. Okay. Um, he was uh, born in Boston. That's where I live uh, these days. And he died in Philadelphia. He had 180 degrees from Harvard and Yale. Are there any Yale people here? No. I'm from Harvard. Uh, when I was a grad student in late 60s and 70s, we used to say Yale is a four-letter word. <laughs> so just <laughs> take it for what it is. <laughs> uh, because there was a lot of rivalry, I, I would say not horrible rivalry, but uh, enjoyable rivalry between Harvard and Yale. <clears throat> um, okay. I mentioned this already. Um, what happens when the current flows uh, into the ground, uh, so that current has to go somewhere in the in the ground. It flows in those paths. So uh, there is a voltage. We call it step voltage. That means if you're walking on the ground, your left foot and right foot may be at different potentials, so that current will flow through you. You may have seen cattle and certain animals just walking, and they're injured because of this step voltage on the ground not necessarily a direct hit from the lightning. Um, and if you're uh, 
outside and there's a lightning hitting a tall tree and the current flowing through the tall tree, one thing you don't want to do is touch that tree. Then the current will flow through you. And it's amazing. I'm always amazed by if a person is hit by lightning, the path that it finds. You know, it might hit somewhere and the current is flowing through your body. It might flow through your brain, your heart, your belt buckle because there's some metal in it. And it may go down your, your leg. It may go to your shoe. And the, your, if, if it has uh, laces, there's uh, some metal tip at the, at the end of the lace. It'll find that metal. Then it'll go in, into the ground. So it's, it does amazing things. And it is uh, detrimental, of course. But there have been some strange cases of what has happened to people who have been hit by lightning. If the lightning current flows, the right way in your brain uh, or your heart, you might even get cured of something. Uh, there was one case who was a, a, a man who was really blind from birth and he got his vision back when he was hit by lightning. So strange things can happen with uh, the current flow. There is an opportunity there. If you can figure those things out, you just have to pass current the right way in your body to cure certain things. Uh, I already mentioned the step voltage. And survivors uh, suffer a whole lot of things, loss of consciousness, amnesia, paralysis, burns, etc. cetera. Um, this is um, the program that I got involved in with um, NASA Langley. Uh, it was a seven year program from 1980 to 1986. Uh, what we did was we NASA wanted to understand and protect their flying systems from lightning. Uh, this is an airplane called F-106B. This was used in the Vietnam uh, War. Uh, it's a vintage Vietnam aircraft. Are there any Vietnam veterans that might know? Uh, so after this plane was decommissioned, different agencies got one of one such aircraft. NASA got one such, and we converted that into a research aircraft. And uh, what we did was we put, that's me in the foreground, uh, we put a lot of sensors on the airplane skin, uh, on the pitostatic uh, tube, uh, on the nose of the aircraft. There's a little long tube, which you may see there, that has sensors like pressure measurement, temperature measurement. When you're flying, uh, even commercially, they will say outside temperature is so much, outside pressure is so much. Uh, you have to measure it. So there are sensors outside the aircraft measuring these things. That tube is called a pitostatic tube. And uh, I'll talk about the sensors. Um, and uh, this uh, airplane flew through almost 1,500 thunderstorms in uh, over 200 flights over seven years. It was hit by lightning 714 times with no damage to the aircraft. Uh, NASA pilots uh, flew this aircraft. I always wanted to be in the back seat, but I <laughs> never got a chance. Uh, it holds the world record for lightning strikes in one of the flights it was it it was hit 72 times in just one flight and over north carolina and uh, it was uh, flown by uh, nasa research pilot bill brown he was formerly with the navy and u.s air force pilot uh, lieutenant ricky rondo and um, <clears throat> I like to say that NASA pilots are really gutsier than the Air Force and <laughs> Navy pilots. Uh, you know, you, you have to sit in this plane, you fly at different altitudes into thunder clouds, sort of reminds me, reminds me of these uh, storm chasers in Florida these days. Uh, and uh, they want to get hit by lightning. And I put sensors on the plane and these sensors are measuring currents and charges in electric fields and magnetic fields and so on. And we have a recording instrumentation on board. All this data goes into the recording instrumentation. I get that data. That was my share. I mean, designing some sensors and analyzing the data. That was my contribution of a team of 50 people. Um, these show the sensors on the skin of the aircraft. I means current, uh, you know, uh, electric field, magnetic field, etc. So we flew these years and how many times it was hit. And this is a cam there were cameras 
you can see here in the top right picture, uh, the lightning attaching at some point and detaching. And in that process, it uh, it charges up the airplane. Um, okay, this is the same aircraft in NASA Langley. Uh, you see a lot of uh, uh, pot marks on the, on the airplane. And uh, <clears throat> there were some that were caused by lightning itself. I mean, lightning actually burnt off the paint on the aircraft. And uh, some that uh, when it did burn off, but we knew it hit it there, we'd put some paint on it just to show you where the lightning hit. And there were some paint that uh, was burnt off. And I, rem I remember this pilot saying, he didn't like his, <laughs> his plane with paint taken off. He said, I'm flying buff naked. <laughs> So that's the part, you know, pilots are, uh, or aircraft owners are very possessive of their airplane. I remember when I first went and designed a sensor on this tube uh, to measure lightning, I, I had to make two holes in that tube to attach my sensor. And I went to NASA and said, uh, I need to put two holes in your pedostatic tube. And they said, go away and don't ever come back. <laughs> they don't want anything done to their airplane. Uh, but finally, the Air Force convinced them we have to do it for the research, and that's how things work sometimes. <clears throat> um, no, no. The Faraday cage helps, but uh, they didn't put the cockpit. We had done some pre-test, pre-flight analysis, see what happens if the cockpit gets hit and stuff like that. The worst thing that can happen to an airplane in flight is if the fuel tank ruptures. Everything else you can survive. If the fuel tank ruptures, you know, that's the end of the news. Uh, so at the end of this program, we came up with a protocol for how to protect. In, um, with respect to the fuel tank, we said the whole fuel tank has to be made of one contiguous sheet of metal with only one uh, joint. In that joint, if the maximum lightning current is 200 kiloamps, 200,000 amps, you can put 700,000 amps, 800,000 amps, make sure that joint survives. That is the worst thing. In, I've been on airplanes when they were hit by lightning, even a 747. I was, once I was on a flight from here to India or through Hong Kong, and I was sitting on the right side of the plane. There was a lot of uh, storm activity. A 747 was going like this. So you can imagine, you know, it's one of the biggest, it is the biggest plane in the world. Uh, the turbulence was more or scarier than the actual lightning. I could see the lightning detach from, uh, first of all, when he came to land in Hong Kong, uh, he couldn't land. So he sort of came and took off and circled and came back to land. It was a British pilot. <laughs> British was very cryptic in their announcements. And he said, uh, oh, there's a lot of activity <laughs> in the air. I will do my best to land. <laughs> that wasn't very comforting to passengers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he finally landed. I could see the detachment point. I was working <laughs> on the field at the time. So as I was exiting the plane, the pilot was standing there. I told him, we were hit by lightning, right? He said, yeah. You know, most of the time when the airplane hit, nothing happens. I mean, you might lose some incidental, unimportant piece of electronics. If you lose one frequency communication, use something else. There's a lot of redundancy built into these things. So you're all safe flying. <laughs> don't, don't be too concerned. Hmm. Um, you can also bring airplanes into labs and actually cause lightning. You can have one conductor above the airplane, one on the, on the ground, and you apply enough voltage, it'll strike. And you can do some testing in the lab like so. And there are also, you know, if you go to San Francisco airport, there are all kinds of radars working, right? There are all kinds of very high intensity radio frequency fields in the airport. You need them. You need them to land the plane, to take off from the airport. You need for communication, navigation, surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the airplanes have to survive in a very harsh environment in the airport. There was a case in Germany, uh, in Munich airport, there's a, like a bend in the road and uh, <clears throat> all these airport fields were even getting onto the highway, call it Autobahn, and their fancy Mercedes cars were going haywire, just going around the bend around Munich airport. They said, what to do? These fields are exiting. The airplanes were safe, but the Mercedes wasn't. <laughs> so they erected tall fences around the airplane to sort of like a Faraday cage to kill these fields from getting out. So, so there are standards for, uh, um, you test your aircraft for to withstand these uh, uh, fields. Um, by the way, um, this is my claim to fame. This is the sensor that I designed sitting on a pitot-static tube. Uh, this was in the 80s. You know, uh, it was in the Cold War era. Soviet Union uh, dis uh, dissolved in 1989. So we were locking horns with the Soviet scientists. Uh, what can they do? What can we do to them? Stuff like that. And there was this uh, thing called nuclear electromagnetic pulse. What is that? That is a nuclear explosion in space. If you have a nuclear explosion in space, nobody dies on the ground. No building comes down. The X-rays can't even make it to ground and give you cancer. Nothing happens. But all the electronics on the ground, on the surface, is killed because there is a big radiation, electromagnetic radiation from that uh, uh, nuclear explosion in space. So we had the capacity to do that to the USSR, and they had the capacity to do that to us. Neither of us did, did it because of this um, construct called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. If you do it to us, we're going to do it to you. So nothing happened at that time. But nowadays, again, this is revived because there are other countries now uh, getting capabilities, not only with uh, nuclear bombs, but also the delivery systems to take them to space and explode it there. So that has been revised, uh, revived. Now, people used to say, if my airplane is a protector for lightning, why should I worry about nuclear explosion in space? It's already protected from lightning. We argued no, because if a lightning hits, it hits one airplane, right? But if a nuclear electromagnetic pulse happens, it can affect all the airplanes in the sky. So it's a wave phenomenon, not a attachment detachment phenomenon. That's why we brought the same airplane into a facility in uh, Kirtland Air Force Base where I have spent a lot of time. Uh, we tested it for a nuclear pulse and showed that there are two different animals. You have to protect them for both. Uh, <clears throat> this is the South Baldy Peak uh, in uh, New Mexico where uh, we went on the top of a mountain, put some sensors and did test. And you can also send a rocket uh, into the air. The rocket will bring the lightning to your tower. That's the triggered lightning. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, the very, mostly the lightning is coming from cloud to ground. Very rarely the opposite can ha happen. Uh, it's called the upward flash as opposed to the downward flash. And I would like to mention a little bit about, this is the latest uh, lightning facility in uh, Switzerland, in the Swiss Alps. Uh, there's a town called Santis. Uh, you can see the Alps mountain and a tall tower there. Uh, and uh, and um, you can also see a little facility here that contains a laser beam. Instead of sending a rocket, we shoot a laser into the ground, into the air. That laser will attract lightning and bring it to that tall tower. Uh, you know, the Swiss do everything in a very methodical, systematic. You know, if you, you know how wonderful Swiss chocolates are, <laughs> how wonderful their watches are. In fact, I once asked a Swiss professor, why is your chocolate so good? You make the best chocolates in the world. You know what he told me? He said, we studied the tongue. He studied the tongue. On your tongue, there are these taste buds. And he said, we measured the taste bud dimensions. When we make our chocolate, we take the cocoa and grind it to that size so that 
<laughs> as soon as you put the chocolate on your tongue, it just gives you that kick. So that's how their, their chocolates are so good. Uh, so, you know, if, uh, I've been to Switzerland maybe 50, 60 times in my career. Uh, there is a physics lab under the city of Geneva, and that's where I normally go, uh, where they're looking into how the uh, universe was created and all kinds of nice things. Um, this is the tower. This is the laser lab. You can shoot up a laser and bring the uh, lightning. You can see the laser going up and bring the lightning to the tower. We made all kinds of measurements. Uh, this is still an ongoing uh, facility where measurements are done even today. Um, then there, are, uh, I already mentioned that on your poll, uh, PG&E has this all the time. Uh, there'll be some transformers blowing up and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> it is a second leading cause of weather deaths in the United States, kills more than hurricanes and tornadoes combined. And I'm sorry to say that in this time when things are happening in Florida. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> almost out of my time. Uh, this is uh, in a golf course. I'm sure there are golfers in this room. Uh, when, uh, if a lightning strikes, you don't want to be in the open field like that. And if it does, uh, the current will flow into the ground. And if I step from here to here, here to here, I will get electrocuted because of the current paths. Okay, uh, you can see how uh, the current, what the current has done to the, uh, there. Safe locations, no place is absolutely safe from lightning. However, if you are in an enclosed metal vehicle like a car or a bus, you are, you are protected. Um, if, uh, this is what the army says together, never separate them. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, they both are just nearly co-potentials. Um, and um, the, there are facilities that are lightning certified facilities. If I call that as a 10, being outdoors is no protection. In your home somewhere is a good one. And in your car is your a little less safe and things like that. Um, uh, also, US DOD has a set of satellites that are always looking down and looking for uh, lightning. Um, I have a pet theory I asked myself one once, uh, when was the first lightning may have occurred? Uh, to answer that question, I looked at when did the Earth, when did the universe get created? 13.8 billion years ago, there was uh, uh, the Big Bang, if you believe in that. Okay, now after the Big Bang, it took about eight, nine billion years for planets, Earth, Earth's atmosphere to form. Earth's atmosphere didn't form, the Earth didn't, wasn't created 13 billion years ago. It's only four or five billion years old. So it took eight billion years after the Big Bang for our Earth and its atmosphere to get created. So if you're late for a report next week, <laughs> that's due next week, you can say, hey, it took eight billion years for my Earth to form. <laughs> What's a week? <laughs> Uh, what what you know? It's a big deal if I'm late by a week or day or whatever. Um, I would like to stop here. My time is up. I guess I'm open to questions. In the downward flash, it's flowing the first way from uh, down and out. In the upward flash, which is a more rare occasion, it's going the other way into the cloud. Well, exactly, through the flash into the ground. Yes. Lightning rods. Yes. Um, I've seen photographs of, of a, a rocket at NASA where lightning hitting the lightning rod and the, the voltage drop because of that uh, going down that cable caused the lightning to divert and hit the ground elsewhere. Its preferred path was not through the lightning rod, but directly to ground then. Directly to the ground. Um, I'm not sure exact uh, scenario there, but it must have found another path, a parallel path, 
that was a shorter resistance. Maybe there was something in the air that caused it to go the other way. <laughs> yes, sir. I um, wanted to, uh, I was surprised that you didn't talk about the effects on the electronics of lightning strikes. Yes. Uh, my wife and I were on a flight from Calgary. We were about 10,000 feet into a thunderstorm. Plane got hit by lightning. Yes. A window got blown in. And two of the three flight computers, this was a new uh, Airbus 320. Okay. Two of the flight computers were burnt out. And uh, it was pretty scary all around. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> what he's saying is, what is the effect of lightning on electronics? There is a red book there on that table that I published during COVID. The title of the book is Effect of Such Pulses on Electronics. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was COVID time. I was sitting at home for a couple of years, and that's when I wrote that book. Uh, the coupling of uh, lightning or microwaves or any RF to electronics is a well-researched, well-understood phenomena. There are different levels of uh, <clears throat> levels of uh, effects. And if I were to protect an airplane like Air 320, I will say, what is the electronics that you have to have working all the time to fly the plane? We call that flight critical electronics. And if it's a fighter plane, there are certain electronics which we call mission critical. That means the fighter plane has a mission. He has to go there, drop something, and come back. So there is mission critical electronics, flight critical. So we categorize all the electronics on an airplane into different categories. And we spend our money, protection money, wisely. Um, we don't have infinite dollars to protect every bit of electronics in the plane. So you can afford to lose some things. This was critical. They sh obviously, they, they didn't provide enough redundancy, is my guess. So it's wonderful that you were able to present to us today as detailed minutiae you got into. I think everyone really enjoyed this uh, presentation. It's a very unique presentation. So part of our re regular routine here is when the speaker presents, we like to give you a choice between a bottle of red wine, white wine, or we also have olive oil. So olive which oil. of these would you prefer? Um, there's no choice of both. <laughs> 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 We'll send you. We'll send you home with two. <laughs> I'm taking them. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I had given a choice of two topics uh, for my presentation. The second topic was weaponization of outer space. Um, I think most. It is very likely most humans have weaponized their inner space, but uh, weaponization of the outer space. If that interests you, maybe I'll come back someday. Great. So raffle uh, ticket. When four nine one seven. <laughs>